got a brief tour of the facility, which was very impressive. And there were two other women there, roughly about my age, a little bit younger. But during the interview, I could tell from the postmaster that she was not going to hire me, that she had a federal, I bet she had a federal requirement that she had to hire two minorities that day because she said there were two people that were going to be hired and I was the only man there. There were other two other women. Now logically, now this is not to be sexist, but in a job that requires constant physical lifting, would you rather have a 25-year-old woman or a 35-year-old man doing that same job? True, I would probably have had more health issues in the long run. But in terms of day in, day out, it would make more sense to hire a 35-year-old man to do the same job. Men are physically stronger in that kind of work, are more willing to work, because chances are one of these, if not both of these women, if they didn't have children yet, they were going to have children statistically within the next five to eight years. And I'll bet you they're mothers by now, or at least one of them is. But statistically, a man will stay with that job just based upon how we reproduce. But yet, thanks to federal law, I was cast aside because I was the wrong gender, wrong age, wrong ethnicity. Boy, I go off on some weird tangents, don't I? But at the same time, I'm not so prejudiced that I allow that to stand up and say, well, the only reason why this Indian woman uh, won the Miss America pageant is because she's Indian. I believe she got there on her own merits. And to be honest, I have not seen a picture of you yet. But it just bugs me, though, that the people out there that believe that she got, the only reason why she got this title is because of her ethnicity. Now, that kind of attitude needs to stop. It's the same way with President Obama. The only reason why he became president is because he's black. Well, he's also half white. Okay. And he doesn't hide that fact. An American white mother and an African black father. But we'll save that debate for another time. Um, I've been holding off on this story for a few days. I was going to read it sometime last week. But I decided to hold off till a more appropriate time. And uh, it concerns an obituary that has gone viral in recent days. Um, and it, well, if you hadn't heard about it, uh, the woman's name was uh, Mary Ann Teresa Johnson Reddick. And six of her eight children wrote a very scathing obituary about their mother. Uh, seems that the offspring of the woman who died late uh, last month penned a harsh obituary of their late mother, who the obituary said spent her life subjecting them to horrible abuse. Marian Teresa Johnson Reddick's obituary, which has uh, since been removed, originally appeared in the print and online edition of Nevada's Reno Gazette Journal. Uh, Marian Teresa Johnson Reddick, born January 4th, 1935, and died alone on August 30th, 19, or 2013. She is survived by her six of eight children who spent her lifetime torturing uh, in every way possible. Uh, while she neglected and abused her small children, she refused to allow anyone else to care or show compassion towards them. Whenever, or rather, when they became adults, she stalked them and tortured anyone who dared to love. Everyone she met, adult or child, was tortured by her cruelty and exposure to violence, criminal activity, vulgarity, and hatred of the gentle or human or kind human spirit. On behalf of her children, whom she was so abrasively exposed to her evil and violent life, we celebrate her passing from this earth and hope she lives in the afterlife, reliving every gesture of violence, cruelty, shame she delivered on her children. Her surviving children will now live the rest of their lives 
with the peace of knowing their nightmare has finally come to some form of closure. Most of us have found peace in helping those who have been exposed to child abuse and hope this message of our final passing can revive our message that abusing children is unforgivable, shameless, and should not be tolerated in a humane society. Our greatest wish now is to stimulate a national movement that mandates a purposeful and dedicated war against child abuse in the United States of America. Now, Gazette publisher John Mayer told KRNV that the obituary was submitted through a self-service uh, online submission. He also said the online version has been removed while the paper looks into how it got on the, on the site and in the paper. The print version of the obituary stated that Johnson Reddick died on September 30th. KRNV reports that her actual date of death was August 30th. Gawker speculates that Marianne Reddick or Reddick, rather, may have testified before the Nevada Equal Rights Commission in 1970. A woman by the same name told the commission that the employment agency wrote white only on some job postings so that African Americans uh, would know that they had no chance of fulfilling, or rather, at, uh, filling those positions, according to Gawker. So what do you think? Do you think the kids went too far, or do you think they did the right thing? Uh, email me at Gunther's House of Friends at gmail dot com or post on your Facebook page and uh, become a friend with me uh, via Facebook friends. Personally, I think the kids did the right thing. I think this would help them in the long run, especially in uh, genealogical research and trying to get an accurate picture of who this person was. And it would be more interesting to figure out why this woman was so mean. You know why she uh, chose to be so vulgar and uh, in life. Um, I mean, we've all done things in our past that we're not proud of. I know I've done some things in my past I'm not proud of, and I plan to own up to them. You know, I'm trying to be a better person every day, kind of like the uh, premise of "My Name Is Earl." But um, I think KRNV. I understand why they would pull that. That's negative publicity. It could hurt their sales, but in the long run, I think it could also help their sales. Um, so I, I understand both sides of the equation, but I think they did the wrong thing by pulling this obituary because just because you did bad things in your life, I don't think it exonerates you in death. I really don't. And that's one of my, and I know that's one of the uh, tenets of uh, Christianity. That if you repent at the last moment, that you can somehow be saved. Well, poppycock. You know, if that's the case, then Adolf Hitler, Mussolini, and other evil people in history could get exonerated just because at the last moment they repented. It doesn't excuse what they did. The essence of who you are remains. And uh, therefore, I have a problem with that kind of thinking that you could be exonerated in death just because you're dead now. You know. And I was glad that my dad and I came to peace on a lot of things. You know, that he came to peace with a lot of things from his past uh, before he died. You know, for years, you know, I always loved my dad and I miss him very much. But I also knew that he had some demons in his life. And, uh, and as hard as the cancer was on him and on us, you know, in our lives, his substance abuse was a lot harder for me to take. As I tell you, even to this day, I still have strong trust issues uh, because of that. Because when my dad would go on a drinking binge, he would often abandon my mom and I for day, for hours, sometimes days at a time. And I have never forgot that feeling. The first time I remember it was in uh, 1983. 83, 84. I won't go into the story. But to this day... And Facebook, I think, in some ways has reinforced those memories and those feelings. And it is something that I fight constantly every day. In that, say for example, someone that I love or trust or care about 
befriends me on Facebook, you know, someone that I've known for quite a while, or I've gotten to know quite well, and then they suddenly delete me without explanation, and then I run into them later on, that is very awkward to me in of itself. But to me, it brings back those memories, and those feelings of my dad. You know, you know, I opened up to you as a friend in confidence or shared uh, a dream or so with you. You encouraged me for a while and then for, for whatever reason we go our separate ways and then I run into you. You know, is there an opportunity here to rebuild that friendship? You know, to try to make things right? Or do I continue to ignore a friendship request or to send you another friendship request because if you walk out again it reinforces that feeling so you know I'm in constant war all the time and that's one of the reasons why I'm so reluctant to get involved in romantic relationships because I've had a history of picking women who are emotionally distant and every woman I've picked I, with the exception of uh, two of them but they didn't work out for other reasons I won't go into but I so I think the kids did the right thing because writing an obituary is very therapeutic and one of the most honorable things I did was write my dad's obituary for uh, radio and TV news and uh, you know I'm glad I found peace with that but there are still echoes of things with my relationship with my dad that I deal with to this day. And he's been dead for almost 12 years now. Uh, let's see here. A few other things on my mind. Um, I learned this over the weekend. This is going to be a very long show, I can tell that. But that's one of the advantages of a Monday show. They typically... You know, some of the stuff I backlog to the following Monday, if it's not pertinent to that week, but prior. Uh, but I learned this over the weekend. Uh, former Alaska Governor Sarah Palin and her political action committee are being sued by a newspaper publisher over the use of an iconic September 11th photograph. Well, legal uh, documents obtained by CNN, the new North excuse me, the North Jersey Media Group claims that Palin used their WTC flag raising photograph without permission when it was allegedly posted on her Facebook page and the website for her political action committee, Sarah Pack. The photograph, which depicts three firefighters raising an American flag over the rubble of the World Trade Center, was taken on September 11, 2001. I'm sure you've all seen it. Well, it was taken by Thomas Franklin, Thomas E. Franklin, a staff photographer at the uh, publisher's subsidiary of the record in New Jersey. CNN Films recently produced a documentary entitled The Flag that explored the story of the banner, which went missing. Well, the photograph has drawn national attention, be made into a stamp in 2002, later enshrined in the Library of Congress, according to the photograph's website. Screen captures sent to CNN by the uh, publishing company show the picture on Sarah Palin's Facebook page embossed with the words, We will never forget. CNN did not, however, independently view the photos on uh, Palin's uh, copyright on this iconic photo. That's according to Jennifer Borg, general counsel of the uh, National, or rather of the North Jersey Media Group, when neither Ms. Palin nor her uh, Pack responded to our demand letter to remove the photo. We were left with no choice but to seek redress through the courts. In the uh, federal lawsuit filed Friday, the publisher asked that uh, Palin and Sarah Pack be forced to stop using the photograph and pay damages or defendants' profits. CNN reached out to Palin and her representatives for comment Saturday, but not but did not receive an immediate response. Again, what do you think? I think she should remove it, and I think if she, uh, since she didn't remove it in a timely manner, I think she should pay uh, some penalties for using a copyright photograph. Um, it's, 
it was bad enough that you 